Uh, hello, everyone. This is uh, Bogdan Vosniak from ST Slovenia. Um, I am a technical consultant for a, a partner for Microfocus Partner Company. Uh, I've been working with for for the past 18 years. I've been working with uh, products um, in in the field of of IT service monitoring, starting with the old NNM and going on to operations manager and BSM and site scope and now OMI. Um, so this is basically my background. Uh, and today I want to talk to you about um, how to survive the OM to OMI migration. I know that this is the deadline is approaching for uh, uh, end of support for, for the old OM. Uh, but um, for those of you who have not yet migrated or are reluctant to do so, um, this presentation is basically for you. I want to talk about um, on a business case of one customer, which is not big in terms of scale. In terms of scale is more like you would call it a demo environment. But it is interesting in terms of uh, integration and the depth of integration and depth of customization that was done on this customer and had to be migrated to OMI. And uh, so I hope you, you can all take away uh, some, some experience or some, something what, what uh, lies ahead if you have a, a somewhat similar environment. No, okay. That's great, Saul. So go ahead. It's all yours, Bogdan. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to talk about the environment that we did. Like I said, this is a business case, a real business case that we did last year. Uh, the challenges we faced, the plan we set up, the execution of the plan, and about all the things that went wrong and were ultimately overcome, and what happened after we moved to the production. So the environment um, they used was uh, made around the OMW, Operations Manager for Windows. Um, this was their hub, their main central point of the events, uh, events that came in from network environment through the NNMI, from uh, servers and applications through SiteScope, and some applications sent direct SNMP traps and other types of messages into, and everything was uh, uh, um, concentrated in operations manager, which was then in turn uh, upward integrated to service manager for ticketing, automatic ticketing. Um, anyone who did that, you, you, you know, you have to have a very clean environment, otherwise you will have hundreds of tickets open and you would just get a mess. So that was, um, that was a problem. Um, Rock just asked, uh, told me I'm not showing full screen. I'm not sure what that means. Can you see my screen? Yeah, you look fine to me. It looks I fine. I see your whole okay. screen. Okay, good. Yeah, but I, I do see uh, a screen. Sorry, this is Amory. Uh, I do see um, your next slide on the right hand side. Uh, okay, so am I showing you the wrong monitor, obviously? Let's no, see. I do <laughs> see your presentation, but. Hang on. Let's see if this, no, this is not better. Good. Um, what can I do? Probably have to choose another monitor. Now we do see your screen, but maybe you can ch um, go to a slide, mo as a slideshow. Yeah, when yeah, I go the to bottom. the slideshow, um, it, it switches to the wrong monitor. So this is a slideshow, but it, sh it should be on a different it's monitor. Still it's still it's okay. clear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So, right. Um, like I said, the OM uh, was in is integrated into service manager for ticket opening and uh, to enterprise alert application for notification of critical alerts through four different channels, channels the, the SMS channel, the email, the voice, and the mobile application. On top of that, the customer has some custom developed applications for the features that were not available at the time of installation in, in, in out of the box HP environment. And of course, some reporting uh, which, which uh, reported on, on um, systems resources, uh, monitor system resources. 
So this was basically the environment. And what we had to do is, like I said, replace OMW with OMI. We had to upgrade service manager to the latest uh, version. We decided to get rid of the external database to make uh, OM more robust and more independent. And if possible, to get rid of as many as possible of these custom applications because they're difficult to maintain. And if we can uh, replace them with uh, um, some out of the box feature of OMI, that would be a bonus. So um, the challenge was, of course, to migrate all of the event sources. Like I said, we had OM agents, we had SNMP trap sources from applications, devices, all kinds of things on the network. Uh, all the de network devices monitored by NNMI and Sidescope. Um, migration of, of the policies. The customer has a, a very heavily modified and a lot of custom policies within operations manager for uh, to the point where we were translating the text of the events. Um, so this was a big, a big challenge, how to move all this and what will happen when we move them into a new environment. Then the migration of the service models, because for a lot of their services, service models were built, and not only built, but they had very complex propagation and calculation rules, which had to be uh, migrated. Um, and then, of course, the migration of the ticketing integration into service manager was, was again heavily customized. Um, the migration of this custom application, upgrading service manager to the latest version, finding a new reporting solution, and of course, provide the minimum downtime during the migration, um, and the possibility to fall back if migration fails. I mean, we, we, we didn't think the migration will fail, but the customer was worried because they want to run this monitoring system 24 seven, that uh, finally, when we make the switch into production, something will go wrong and we have to be able to switch back. and remedy whatever problem we might have there. So the plan was to um, to do a side-by-side -side, uh, installation of the new products, uh, to do the event, event integration uh, between the old OM into the new OM, uh, and then just slowly build all the fun, new functionality, move all the functionality into the new products, and then at the end, just switch all the event sources, which have to be which had to be done in the same business day. Switch all the event sources and just uh, shut down the old systems. Um, this was the plan. This is how it was executed, and it eventually worked. Um, so that's not much of a story. Uh, my story was about around everything that happened in between when we were building this parallel system. Um, starting with um, the, the, the paradigm shift from the old objects into CIs and KPIs and status calculations. And this was just, from the point of view, I don't know, of a, of a system administrator, this was just going into a jungle because everything was just blown up and all the things that we never knew or cared about, now we suddenly had to worry how the status of the object of the CI is calculated, where does it come from. So to keep the, the, the problems at the minimum and to mimic the old system as much as possible, it was decided early on that we will only use events for the status uh, calculation of the, of the CIs, of the objects in the new system. So nothing else, we just want, when the event comes just like it was in the old OM. When the event comes, the event has a color, has a severity, and I want this light bulb to, to, to light up with the, with the same color. So, um, but of course, the first thing you have to do, you, you realize in the new OMI, the event KPI is disabled by default. Um, because obviously, the, the HP wanted us to move to this new fancy KPIs, which, which were much too granular for, what, for our need. So the first thing we had to do is, is enable this, this uh, um, event KPIs. So after that, we were able to mimic the old system and then start building the service model. Um, the, the migration guide is, is very promising about how much topology can transfer from the old um, service models into new ones. 
Well, in reality, I can only transfer nodes, uh, the ones that actually receive events. Everything else had to be rebuilt from scratch, which is not such a big thing, but you have to be aware of it. But then when you start building it, you say, which CI types am I going to use? There are so many. For all of you who, who, who ventured into OMI, there are so many CI types to choose from. So again, we didn't find a really good guide about this, but the ultimate solution was that only the top level objects will be of type business service because they have some special properties that they can, we can use. Uh, such as the historical uh, KPI logging, uh, and all others will be CI collection. This was because they're very easy to to, to implement. Uh, but then, of course, there were exceptions because of the special propagation and calculation rules. Um, for the, those of you who know, in the old operations manager, you had a very, very uh, complex uh, calculation rules but I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later. First, I want to say when you build a tree, uh, a service tree, then you have to create a view, a view that will show you this tree because you build the tree in the database, but then you have to show it to the, to the, to the operators, to the users. And even that is, is it's, it's not a trivial thing. Um, it's not difficult, but you have to know exactly what you're doing. So. After some trial and error, we, we realized or we were given hints from, from the HP um, that what you have to use, the basic thing is that you use this, what is written here, the impact perspective. Uh, you use a special perspective into the view with which you make sure that the tree is drawn correctly so that uh, the status is, and this impact perspective will, will provide the same path that is used for status calculation, which means that um, usually the status comes when the event comes for some uh, for some uh, CI for some object, like here this this server at the bottom, the yellow one, uh, it will propagate upwards, and you will have this propagation path correctly written. So this was one of the things that we learned that this uh, we have to use this impact perspective. So that's good to know. Um, about the status calculation, OM had a fantastic tool uh, uh, called multi-threshold calculation rules, where you could, uh, if you had several children under one object, you could uh, very granularly define what will happen when uh, one of them or more of them become of certain status. And the customer was using a lot of these rules and it was um, the first uh, surprise. There are no multi-threshold calculation rules in OMI. You have a simple rule which basically propagates the most critical status upwards, and then you have the percentage rules, uh, which is really a very, very simplified version of this multi-threshold calculation rules. And then you have uh, groovy scripts. You have the API, a scripting API, with which you can do whatever you want, but you have to you have to script it from 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 scratch. And the next thing, propagation rules. That's another thing that does not exist in OMI, where you could say um, I have a child, which is not really that critical to me, and I want to propagate its status upwards with a diminished uh, severity. So if it lights up, let's say with a, a, a major severity. I want to decrease this severity so the, the parent will only light up with minor severity. Uh, so we had to implement this. We even had a situation where you did not want to propagate at all. Why would you do that? Why would you have a, 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 a CI in a service tree which you do not want to propagate its status? Well, uh, the simple answer is because it was there. We had to move it. We had to migrate it. And the customer said, we need, we need this. Um, so it had some practical um, uh, application because uh, the system was designed in a way that all major and critical alerts triggered automatic incident creation in service manager. So if you got a critical alert, 
for a CI, which is not important, you still wanted to open a ticket, but you didn't want it to influence your service. You just wanted to see a little red light shine somewhere in the, in the service tree, but you didn't want to propagate that. So this was, this was, these were all the challenges we had to do. And like I said, there are no propagation rules, not in this form in OMI. So what we end up doing is creating all this GUI script, actually mimicking the multi-threshold calculation rules, uh, scripting it from scratch until it behaved exactly like it did in, in the old OM. And then we created some special um, CI types um, and then this script said, okay, you can see here uh, in, in the color, uh, I have the CI, uh, the left hand side, which is, which is kind of blue green is the normal CI. And then the one that has the arrow downward arrow, this was, uh, I used this one. I said, okay, this will be decreased by one. It will propagate its status decreased by one. And then the right hand side, you, you have this empty square which does not propagate its status. So we can see here the end result. Um, when we propagate it from the red one, you don't propagate this because the parent is yellow. So the status that actually propagates at this moment on this picture is this middle one, which propagates its major status, but it is decreased by one. Uh, so this was a major thing after we had this done, it was basically, we basically uh, had the, the project figure out. But this was a major thing how to get all these things done. Like I said, the documentation is there, but it's, it's not really specific on how to do these specific things. So it was a little, a lot of trial and error and, and, and some help from some great people from, from Microfocus that we finally got this thing going. Okay, going on to policy migration. Um, we had to obviously move from old infrastructure spy into management pack for, for infrastructure. Uh, where again, we, we ran uh, into this different paradigm, the way uh, policies are handled in, in the new product. Uh, you have now management templates and you have aspects and you have uh, management policies and then you combine policies into aspects which are then combined into templates. And it seems, it seems complicated. I know it has a purpose and I kind of like it now, but um, when you first see it, it's it's a mess and it's it takes a while to, to get used to it. But here, there was not so many problems. Even with the custom monitoring policies, uh, they transferred pretty well. The only hiccup we had was that at some point, some policies had some kind of instrumentation folders attached to them. And when, when you try to edit them in OMI, they wouldn't edit, the editor wouldn't open. So ultimately the solution was to cop to, to create an empty policy in OMI to create the raw uh, to copy the raw data from from the old policy into the new policy and then save it um, and then it worked. So this was the only hiccup related to the policy. Otherwise, policy migration went pretty smoothly over to to, to OMI. Um, the same could be said about service manager integration. Um, the old service manager had the so-called SC Auto, this kind of script-based engine, which uh, which was the integration point between the operations manager and the service manager. The new one, integration was based on web service, and um, of course, out of the box, nothing worked. Any feature that I'm about to show you today, nothing worked out of the box. Uh, but fortunately, everything so. We had a ton of support cases, uh, but in the end, um, the only problem with this was that there was a delay. It took longer than we thought. Ultimately, everything was solved, but it just took longer than we thought. Um, so um, we had special things here because the customer had uh, this kind of delay with in in uh, incident creation because for the noisy, for the noisy sources um, that would just jump up and down uh, a lot, uh, you would have incident created all the time. And so this, this in the old system, this thing was, was scripted into this integration script and the script would wait for 90 sec seconds during uh, business hours or five minutes outside of business hours before 
uh, opening the incident. And if the event was closed during this time window, then no incident would be open. And this was something that was, like I said, scripted before, but now the OMI has the so-called time-based event automation, and we were able to use this feature, out-of-the-box feature, to implement this uh, same functionality. So this was, this was great. Uh, mapping um, server CIs, uh, the, the service manager CIs to, 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 to correct CIs in OMI was also not the problem. The only problem was the customer wanted to see, again, the light whenever uh, uh, an event that tells you that the service manager is not available, you get an event. from The OMI will create an event. But there is no CI, no object associated to this event. Uh, so if you build a service tree where you want to see uh, the, uh, a graphical representation that the service manager integration is not working, you don't have it. You just get an event. And um, what we end up doing is creating our own object, our own CI, and using the so-called related CI hint, which is here in colors, uh, which will give you basically four hints in these four different colors that you see on the screen. And um, this is hard-coded. You can't do anything about it. So uh, what was advised to us was to create a CI, an object, that is using one or more of these fields as their properties. Uh, they didn't say which properties we have to fill in. So this was, again, trial and error. But ultimately, as you can see here in the table below, um, I used two of the properties um, to match this CI to, to the event. And with this, um, then this integration started working properly. And whenever service ma manager is not available, we get a nice little light uh, in the service tree. So this is, again, something that you will probably not find in the documentation. As far as the custom applications go, um, the customer used the event archive. The OMI, um, the old OM, had this problem. Um, the database was not very good. It was, it was initially Microsoft SQL Express. It was not coded very well. So if you had a lot of history messages, uh, it would take forever to open, to open them, to open history. And that's why um, they had a, a custom solution where they, they would only use maybe a week of, of events in the operations database. Everything else was exported into an external SQL database. And uh, fortunately for us, OMI has a better database. We're using embedded Postgres, but it's coded better. So there was no need for the external solution. And we were able to do this event archive. So we scratched one of the custom applications off the list, which was great for the customer. And then they had another thing which is really critical for them. Uh, it says his SLA reporting and service status portal, which is basically they used the, the four objects, the top level objects on their service tree, and they publish their uh, status on their web portal uh, for everyone to see. And it has to be up 24 seven and it's very critical for them and the SLAs are bound to this and they create reports uh, which show the downtime of these services. So this was very crucial for them to, to, to implement the new system. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it is still scripted. Basically, the system remained the same. Uh, the only challenge here was how to get the status out of the OMI. And um, in the old OM, uh, we used direct database access. In the new, we tried to first use the so-called CI status alert, which sounds like a good idea, because whenever the CI, you just say, okay, when this CI changes status, I want to be informed. I want, to, I want you to create a, a, an action, uh, run a command, and it will do whatever it has to do. It turned out it's unreliable. Sometimes it just wouldn't fire. So that was one thing we had to deal with. Ultimately, we, we, we found out there is a web service API which will give you the status of any CI from the database. And we used polling and getting this information out of the database and this ultimately works and this is still how it works today and it works great. So, so this was one thing again. So it was clear that the, the OMI at the time of migration still had a, a, a lot of glitches and 
I was surprised because like I said, we come from a small country, we have a demo environment, so to speak, Every even our enterprise environments are demo environments. How come nobody came up with this before? <laughs> Why is it always us? But anyway, um, we were uh, able to overcome it in the end. Well, uh, one thing that we had to use was downtime. So whenever um, there was some maintenance work on some of the servers, on some of the applications, or sometimes even uh, uh, service objects, um, they wanted to, to create a downtime so that the notifications would not fire, so that the events would not come. Um, and usually, of course, it's very difficult to say to people, okay, whenever you have a planning downtime, tell us about it. Yeah, usually in real life, it just happens. And they say, okay, now in, in one hour we're starting Starting the maintenance, so make sure you don't fire events. So th there was a need for the unplanned downtime. And now OMI doesn't have unplanned outtime. So ultimately the solution was to use planned downtime, which you could set just one minute into the future. So it was kind of a it is kind of unplanned downtime. So this was this was a solution that the customer agreed with. Another problem was um, that they wanted to uh, put a part of the of the service tree, part of the ser whole service, into a downtime. And in the old OM, you could just click on the on the service uh, object in the tree, and and set it to downtime. And everything beneath that, all the children, all the dependent object, were automatically in the downtime. You know, MI doesn't work that way. You have to select every specific CI, which is in real life just you know not feasible. Um, so what we ended up doing was creating this kind of presets, uh, templates with the downtime and clicking all of the necessary objects and then creating date, downtime date far into the future, like 2030, something like that. Uh, so it would never fire. So whenever you needed to, to put this kind of uh, tree into a downtime, you just copy this uh, template and then set the correct date and time and you will have downtime for all the required CIs. And this was uh, the accepted solution in the end. Of course, the road was again bumpy. Uh, for some reason, we could not select the special CIs that I created for this, uh, uh, for this special propagation, could not be selected in the user interface for the downtime. And at first I thought it was a bug, but then it, it turned out it was a feature. There was an XML file somewhere there, which had some key that prevented this. And we had to change some key from false to true for, for it to work again. This was again something that you could not imagine in a thousand years that somebody implement this uh, into the product. Uh, why am I keep talking about new reporting solution? Because we all know that the, the new OMI has a big and shiny uh, OBR, the Operations Breach Reporter. Yeah, well, the thing with this reporter is it create uh, it it demands a massive amount of hardware. It it uh, initially, if if you look at it, you, you want to run it on 24 cores and 96 gigabytes of RAM. So this was something which was just a no-go from the start for this customer because they had a very um, simple requirement for reporting. They liked the old reporter. It was lightweight. It created simple HTML files. It was working great. It used next to nothing of system resources. And we just needed to, to report on, on, on disk memory and file system utilization for, for, a few, for, for agent uh, based monitor service. So uh, fortunately, uh, the new OMI has a very nice uh, performance grapher, um, and we were able to use this. Of course, the downside is we have to do it manually. We have to make screenshots for all the service uh, once a month and then stack it together in a report. Um, so just the other day, um, I'm also participating uh, twice a month in, in the OpsBridge uh, operations roundtable uh, organized by, by Microfocus. And we were discussing that the old performance manager had a scripting uh, support that you could kind of make a batch script where you could uh, um, specify the systems for which you want the graph to, to, to be generated. 
and we, we, we very strongly emphasize this, this kind of reporter light feature is needed in the OMI. So this, it, the, the, the enhancement request is already created, um, but uh, it's not yet implemented. So I don't know how, you, how, how, how much you have experience with enhancement requests, but this usually takes about three years to implement. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, license migration. Of course, uh, HP or, or Microfocus introduced a simplified license model, which is really simplified for the new customers, but for existing customers can be quite complex. And it took a really long time for us to, to get to the same level to understand what the customer has, what they use, what they need, so that the Microfocus was able to generate the correct licenses for uh, for the customer. During which time um, we had um, a lot of temporary licenses installed, um, and they were they were really helpful at this point. I have to say it, there was no problem with this. So it was just a matter of procedure before this can be completed. But it was, it was a tiring procedure. It took a long time to do, and it was very the main point was to understand how licenses are used or how may be used in the future because the, the licenses uh, are not compatible, the old and the new view. And then, of course, when I installed these licenses, one of them wouldn't install. The management pack license, which was also um, uh, they were entitled to, would not. They, they gave an error, like you see here. License is not decryptable. So I thought, okay, that's a, that's a bad file. So I asked them to send me a new file a new license file, but it was not the problem of the license file. But the solution was, I did not have the, the licensed management pack installed. You have to have at least one management pack that requires a license installed before you can install the license for the management pack. If you don't do it, you get this error. Great. Uh, and then there was, like I said, this, this Procedure took a long time, and many times they extended our uh, temporary license. So we ended up with 20 temporary licenses, which I wanted removed because they were just clogging up the view. When you when you when you printed a license report, you had 20 unused license, expired licenses. It turns out you can only do this directly in the database. So I had to turn again to the support and ask them to um, give me the the query that will remove the temporary licenses, and then we were able to remove them. Um, as far as the user interface goes, um, you know this is the old OMW user interface. It's ugly, but it's useful, and customer liked it. They could see their services and at the top. They could see their events at the bottom. Now, the the service view in new OM looks a bit like this. So I don't know what you think about it. I think it's terrible. Um, or possibly like this, which is not much better. Uh, you can't, you probably don't see that a few of the CIs here are actually not green. They are, they're, they're blue. Um, so this was again a no-go. But uh, fortunately, there is another view called hierarchy view, or it was called 360 view in, in, in BSM. Uh, which shows you, which you see here on the right hand side, which shows you um, a view of all the CIs in a, in a hierarchical view. And then on top of that, we set up a filter to only show us the impacted CIs, the ones that are not normal. Uh, so with this, so if everything is good, if there are no events, this view will be empty. And as soon as you get events, you will, you will only see the impacted CIs. And this was this this turns out great, and the customer likes it. And finally, this was the, their dashboard that you're looking at now, and they're very happy with it. And we're happy that they're happy, so we're all happy. So um, that was a good story. Um, of course, Ogden, I, yeah, we've got to kind of wrap you up because we're running out of time. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay. Um, just, just wanted to say this. I'm actually, I'm, I'm finishing now. So this is the the only hiccup we had still, which American customers will not understand, is with time and date format. 
because Slovenian gets ignored. Um, so we had to move to English Australian, thanks to the Australian friends that they're using 24 hour format. Uh, so we could use that. But again, it was something we had to figure out. And then there were bugs, uh, which were finally uh, solved with, with uh, moving to the latest version. Um, so then went to production and everything uh, was good for two weeks. And then we got again problems in, in the areas which were most painful for the customers. But again, uh, through the hotfix and uh, the, um, some customizations, they were, they were finally fixed. So um, the bottom line, the system is now stable and it's running smoothly. And the customer is happy with the migration. They like the new look. They like the fact that we were able to put some, uh, some uh, features into the out-of-the-box features. Uh, so definitely for all of those of you who are still waiting to do this, uh, this is a way to go. Um, and for, if, you, if you use the latest version, most of the defects will not affect you. Um, just expect that this migration will take longer than expected. So uh, with this, I thank you.